pleased to introduce you a new member uh, of our center, Eric Hermann, uh, is an assistant professor in psychology at McGill University, and he's the director of the Seeing Human Lab. And the interesting story is uh, that we have actually never met in person, so it's uh, the first time today. So it's a little bit like going on a blind date, I guess. <laughs> it's quite <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I think so too. I mean, I think you are leaving the center. Exactly, but before we went on a blind date, uh, we actually knew a lot about Eric already uh, from some online sources. <laughs> <laughs> Research when uh, McGill University actually published an article about him and his research that uh, he recently published in PNSA, PNSA. And I think it is part of uh, that research project that uh, he is going uh, to present to, to us today. And when I read it, I thought, oh my God, this is a new faculty member. We need to find out who this is. And uh, this is exactly kind of what we do. And uh, then, of course, I found out that Eric Heyman is literally a star in psychology. Literally, because he got the Rising Star Award uh, of the American uh, Psychology Society. Uh, he is a fellow of the Society of Experimental Psychology, and he is a McGill uh, Dawson's chair, amongst many other awards that I cannot all name. He has an incredible CV. He has uh, not only uh, published several times in PNAS, uh, but also in, several times in Nature for Human Behavior in the Journal of Experimental Psychology or many, many others. Um, generally, his research fits, I think, exactly with what we do at the center. He examines how individuals perceive and evaluate one another across group boundaries. And by group boundaries, uh, he is looking at race, gender, sexual orientation, and occupation. He uses very interesting techniques uh, that some of us uh, have also tried or use, uh, computer mouse tracking, digital face modeling, and group interactions are his techniques, and he uses several uh, statistical methods uh, and machine learning tools. Uh, so I think he perfectly fits uh, into the center in, in uh, methodological ways as well. Um, and uh, we have, you will see today after your talk and also hopefully for the holiday party that uh, you, when we talk to people, you will have many overlaps. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that a lot of uh, beautiful collaborations will result. Eric Lehmann received his uh, PhD from the University of Delaware, working with uh, Sam Gagner, who some of us uh, know, and worked as a postdoctoral scholar with John Freeman in Dartmouth and New York University. And he was, before he joined the McGill, I think last year, yeah, he joined, uh, uh, an assistant professor at Ryerson University. So let's welcome Eric Lehmann to our center and to the talk. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'm happy to be part of this group, but I'm still learning a lot about it. Uh, I feel compelled to mention that this is a little more formal than I normally dress. <laughs> we have our own holiday party in this building right after this holiday party, which is a formal holiday party, so I didn't have time to switch between my multiple outfits. Uh, okay, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, what I thought would be most interesting to the people in this group. Uh, and I think maybe it was what caught your attention originally. I should mention that this research is led by uh, my graduate student, Eugene Ofosu, who's also a new member of the group uh, who's sitting right there. Uh, so we can talk to him more about it afterwards as well. Um, just to orient you to who I am a little bit, so uh, half of my lab does tend to focus on personal perception, so how we, how we form an impression of this individual, such as like how attractive they are, how intelligent they are. And I'm mostly interested in how this process varies across group boundaries, as Dylan mentioned. Uh, such as race, gender, and how like stereotyping and prejudice might play into that. Uh, what's I'm going to be talking about today, more uh, relevant to you guys, is kind of looking at how that might play out uh, at a regional level. So we take a lot of data and aggregate it into regions, whether it's like something local, like Montreal, or across a number of uh, regions, say in the U.S., and look at how it's associated with various like society level outcomes. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. <clears throat> uh, so the broad question that we were asking with this research project. Uh, something a lot of people have studied in a lot of different forms, and this is just like, does government policy change people's attitudes? 
so for attitudes in this one, we're really focusing on something that's pretty deeply entrenched, maybe like closely uh, associated with like people's like political identity. And this is their attitudes towards same-sex marriage uh, people or, or uh, couples in general. So the more specific question is like, can same-sex marriage legalization uh, cause a change in attitudes? So the law itself causing uh, changes in these deeply entrenched attitudes. Uh, so the theoretical framework uh, comes straight out of psychology here, and this is the idea of norms. Uh, there's a, a lot of research showing that norms shape behavior. Uh, so right now, nobody's interrupting me. That's because we have a norm about the room. We also know that like, if you're in a littered environment, people are more likely to litter, and there's like tons of evidence uh, that really norms like guide our behaviors from context to context. There's also some evidence that's like a little less intuitive, is that not only do our attitudes of maybe us in the room kind of like lead the uh, like lead to the establishment of norms, it's also like a bit of a back uh, a back and forth in that people change their attitudes to be consistent with what they perceive as a norm in a super in an environment. And this can be conscious, but this can also be not totally intentional, where people just do have a shift in attitudes over time. That's mostly what we're focusing on here. Uh, and so the hinge connecting this to the, the current work is that to the extent that laws being passed by maybe a majority uh, are perceived as a norm, laws themselves or various legislation that's associated with like group A, group B might change people's attitudes towards those groups. Uh, so a lot of you guys in here are a little familiar with democracy. You might be thinking to yourself, that's not necessarily how democracy really works. But I want to argue that it's really the perception of the laws. To the extent that you're perceiving a given law as like broad support for a group or broad something that's like targeting a group that might shape uh, public opinion and biases towards those groups. Uh, so there's some evidence that this has happened. It's kind of a harder thing to study in like a wide population level because there's just often not sweeping reform that's associated with different laws that are going to be changing and pushing around people's attitudes in the first place. So in the US, there's interracial marriage was legalized by the Supreme Court in 1978. Uh, and afterwards, there was a 60% increase in support for interracial marriage which at least some scholars, including uh, this Newport legal scholar, uh, directly attributes to the Supreme Court decision as causing this change. A little bit more recently, people in social psych have been focusing on kind of the xenophobic rhetoric that was associated with like Trump's election campaign, but also that, that he won, and have linked this up with um, more per the perception of the acceptability of expressing prejudice towards various stigmatized groups. And there's work going on now uh, linking this with like the precedent, the prevalence of hate crimes and various outcomes that may be associated with the stigmatization. Uh, but the way that this data was collected, either being you know, from uh, 1978, kind of the focus on archival work, or uh, this, this paper by Chris Randall had just like, a few thousand participants from three states, uh, is like limited in its, in its scope, and we wanted to test this in a broader and more comprehensive way. Uh, so, what I'm going to present is just the approach that we're taking here, which is like much more common to people outside of psychology. In psychology, it's like a little a little weird, so maybe it's just going to be rehashing stuff that you're already really familiar with, but I'll, I'll run you through it. So the source of data that we're using here is often Project Implicit, it's something you guys again might be familiar with, but this is a start in 2002 as a website, uh, started by a bunch of Harvard researchers at first, but since then it's become a nonprofit. And if you wanted to go and learn more about your various biases, uh, you could visit this website and complete a, a few measures, one which is known as the Implicit Association Test, which I'll explain more in a second, and also the self-reported <coughs> measures as well. Uh, and it started off focusing on, say, like black-white attitudes, but now there's like a large number of biases. Uh, 20 million people since 2002 have visited this website, so it is by far, the, in my view, the largest repository of psychological measures, uh, with, the, with the focus here being on prejudice. And so, People have been using Project Implicit data to do really cool stuff, just harnessing the large uh, sample size, making interesting conclusions. What we started doing as well that was novel was because these people were visiting the website over the internet, is we were geolocating these people both in like time and space. We knew where they were when they completed the measures. And then say we could take like a thousand people in Montreal and average them together, and we'd argue that this is a uh, the the average level of bias that maybe Montreal might have on X type of bias. So for instance, this is like black-white bias in the US, and you get a sense of like the regional distributions of these biases, and then like things that might uh, co-vary with these biases across these various regions. So that's what the approach that we're adopting here for the most part. Uh, so an important part of this work is the distinction between explicit and implicit bias, which people here might be less familiar with. So explicit bias is pretty much what you think of as sort of old term, old-fashioned racism or straight-up biases. We might ask a question, 
that's very direct, something like, how much do you like straight people relative to gay people? And people respond like, I like straight people better, I like gay people better. So this type of bias is typically conceptualized as like conscious, people know they have it, they're very aware when they're reporting it, um, and they're comfortable being able to report this bias in the first place to the extent that, we're, that they're reporting any sort of bias. Uh, people in the 80s uh, started thinking about this being a problem in terms of the social desirability of biases. Uh, people would might, the concern was that they might tailor their responses. Uh, and so they came up with alternative ways of measuring bias, such as cognitive tasks. One, which is by far the most prevalent nowadays, is the implicit association task. You guys might be familiar. But if not, uh, what might happen is you'd be, imagine this is a computer screen. Uh, in the top and top right and left corners of the screen, there would be categories such as gay and straight, just in this particular IIT. And this would be associated with basically positive and negative valence. So in these series of trials, if something, a stimuli representing gay and good appeared, you hit the left button. If it was straight and bad, you hit the right button. So for instance, left button, poison is bad, uh, heterosexual couple, and the smiles are good. And they switch this around, there's a ton of counterbalancing. And basically what your score at the end of this is supposed to reflect the, the uh, conceptual association you have between uh, generally the idea of like straight people and good things and maybe gay people and bad things and the extent to which there's a difference between those you have a larger implicit bias. So these are two types of biases we're going to be dealing with. This one is thought to be less consciously accessible but people are aware that they have it. It's supposed to be more difficult to control. It's really hard to do an IIT and not show some sort of bias unless you're just like totally making up responses. Um, so for some reasons it has desirable quantities and everything I'm going to be showing you here we're analyzing with both explicit and implicit bias. <coughs> Alright, so you might know a little bit about this, but the way that gay marriage legalization unfolded in the U.S. makes it a really uh, excellent natural case study to kind of uh, establish some sort of causality or causal evidence. So it happened in a staggered manner across a bunch of different states at a bunch of different times, which is really quite perfect. So let me just illustrate this. So on the y-axis here, we just have all uh, 50 states and Washington, D.C. On the x-axis, we have years and time. And what the value of every line represents is the amount of implicit bias in that state at that period of time. And it's hard to really look at and conclude anything. Uh, but why I'm showing you this figure is to pay attention to the gray hash marks, which indicate when each state passed functionally a same-sex marriage legalization within that state. So you can see it's happening at a bunch of different times. And then over here on the right, we have when the Supreme Court decided, uh, like, made a federal change. So federally, uh, same-sex marriage is now legal. And so if we were going to lay this out, it's some sort of quasi-experimental, multiple groups, staggered treatment, pre-post design, which, even though it's not an experiment, it does let us uh, make a strong causal conclusion. Um, so the question we're asking again is, did, did this legislation cause a change in uh, both implicit and explicit anti-gay biases? Uh, which here I'm characterizing as a preference for straight people over gay people. And we can do this by comparing the trend in these biases over time before legalization and after legalization. And this is happening at different times across these different states, but we're just like, looking at average effects. So that's the question. <coughs> so some details of the model for people who care. Uh, these are the average levels of bias on a state-by-state -state basis for both implicit and explicit. Uh, this is a multi-level model that we're running, and we have uh, all these people nested within the states, and states are clustered because that's a level at which legislation was being passed. So between the amount, I'm gonna show you a few different analyses, it's between 600,000 and a million people with 51 clusters, so it's all the states in the DC from 2005 to 2016. All right, so before I show you the real data, I'm gonna show you some fake data, which is a little bit different maybe. Uh, so normally what would happen is I would show you a bunch of data points and we would plot this with some sort of line showing you the average trend. We are dealing with about a million uh, data points, so it would just look like a big black blob that would come to anything. So this might be a little bit different for some of you, but I'm going to be showing uh, what's called a contour plot. And we're basically representing, uh, so lighter values here are just like a larger density of observations. So for paying attention to interpreting this correctly, on the x-axis here we have time, on the y-axis, we have implicit bias, so higher values here represent a straight over gay preference. It's a relative score. And if you're interpreting it right, you should see that, like, yeah, on average, there is like a, a preference for straight people over gay people. 
And what we care about is our trend over time. And it's really hard to look at this and make any conclusions, but this is actually a significantly negative going trend. So there is like a slightly, in these years, there's a slightly decreasing trend of anti-gay bias over time before legalization was passed. What we care about is comparing this to the, to the post. Uh, so here is the trend afterwards. And these are, this is also a negative going slope that is significantly uh, more negative than the pre-legalization trend. And this is our comparison. So you might be thinking, uh, so, so a regular approach that we do in our lab, there's a lot of like subjective researcher decisions that we have to make when we're going about processing the data, making analysis. A regular thing our lab employs is what's called a multiverse approach, where really we just analyze it every way and find out like what we did mattered. Like what were the decisions that we made that, that seemed to be impacting the results? Uh, what's nice in this situation is really nothing, nothing bad. Uh, so let me run you through this. So what I just showed you was uh, data from heterosexual people only with implicit bias. That was the pattern of effects. If we look at this as an explicit bias, we get the exact same pattern of effect. If we include gay, self-reported gay and straight people, uh, so we have a larger sample size here with the same exact pattern of effects for both implicit and explicit biases. We entered in a basic number of like demographic like really basic demographic controls. This is what's available on the Project Implicit website. We get the same pattern effects with both implicit and explicit bias. So it seems to be pretty robust to any of the decisions that we had made earlier on. So another question you might be wondering is, okay, Eric, that's interesting, um, but these are people who are like voluntarily visiting a website to learn more about their biases. Uh, that's probably really unlikely to be representative of the general North American population. Um, are these people representative? Absolutely not. We know they're younger. We know they're more likely to be women. Um, we know that they skew like slightly liberal and there's probably like a bunch of other ways that we haven't recorded that make them very different from the, the average person in North America. So the question is, do our conclusions that we're, that we're making here from this subset of people, do they generalize to the broad North American population? The way that we got at that was using uh, what's known as the American National Electorate Survey. This is representative data that's collected every four years uh, right around the presidential election. It asks like a slew of questions that are of broad interest. People, maybe, maybe you folks are familiar with it. They did have an item uh, asking about uh, attitudes towards gay men and lesbians. And we were able to use that item as essentially an explicit bias analog. And because it covered the same span of years that we had, we were able to run basically the exact same analysis we did in the main model and just shows the same exact pattern of effects as well. So even, and we find this in a lot of our other studies that we're not gonna be showing you today, even though our sample of people is definitely not representative, it does seem to be like the patterns of bias that we're tapping do extend to representative data uh, or predict like outcomes that wouldn't really make sense if they weren't capturing something real in society, for instance. Uh, but we can talk more about that. So one caveat in this uh, work, is 35 states and Washington, D.C. passed some form of uh, same-sex marriage legalization at a local level prior to the Supreme Court decision. And 15 didn't. And so the question we had was, is there something different going on in these states that didn't pass it locally than did? The whole framework, theoretical framework that we were interpreting this in was through norms. What does it, what does it mean when you think like the people around you hold a particular norm versus uh, now we're in a situation where none of us really approve of same-sex marriage, but there's like this ruling body that's far away imposing their norms on us. We wanted to ask that question. So we broke the analyses down into these two different categories of states to compare the trends. So here's the trend uh, that I showed you before among those 35 states alone. This is the exact same as the national trend that I showed you before. And the comparison was, okay, is something different going on in these states of which it was only legal following federal election uh, partly to our, a little bit to our surprise, we actually found the exact same trend pre-legalization in these states. So these states do tend to be like more conservative. I'm thinking of places like um, Nebraska or something. Uh, and even though these levels of bias, the bias are higher there, they're decreasing at the same rate as they were even in more liberal states. Uh, but we found that following same-sex or following the Supreme Court decision, at least for the like the year and a half of data that we have. There was an increased uh, spike in the biases that were reported there. Uh, kind of to actually turned to the political science literature to try to figure out what this might be. And some people have called this something like a backlash effect. Uh, so we think that might be what's going on, but we haven't really been able to examine the whole curve. Personally, I think it's really unlikely that like anti-gay bias is continuing to rise in these states. I would expect something curvilinear 
it kind of <coughs> chills out after a few years, but we don't have the data to test that. Um, but we are going to be doing so in like a year. So this is the, the upward trend in the states that didn't pass the legislation early. Um, yes. Before the yeah. So for those, the 15 states that did not pass it <coughs> locally, this is the trend in bias following the Supreme Court decision. Uh, so in summary, this is some uh, some causal evidence based on our design. The government policy was like changing these biases. Uh, a question I get pretty regularly is, is am I making an argument that it's really only like laws influencing bias? And definitely not. Even though that's the only direction that we really have any sort of evidence for causality with this design, I imagine that these laws would not have been passed in the first place if there wasn't some sort of grassroots movement or local support, which we know actually happened uh, in a lot of these states if that had been the case. Uh, so I have evidence that a bi-directional relationship, which is what we have evidence for here, is one direction. Um, it does seem like there's there's some limited evidence, at least in one analysis, that the locality of the perceived norm may matter. To the extent this is being maybe imposed upon people from afar with something that they perceive uh, is not supported locally, perhaps we would have some sort of this backlash effect. Uh, and I want to point out these these effect sizes are fairly small. It's between one to five percent of the variance, depending on the analysis that we do. This is in line with like fieldwork interventions that <coughs> who are trying to, for instance, uh, improve reading ability in like young black boys in like grade schools. Um, so around like three to four percent of the variance is considered like a pretty successful intervention, which is a, a new bit of information for me that I did not know about before I got into this. Since a lot of the work that I do is experimental. Uh, and we're doing like 40% of the variance in our like little lab-based experiment. At first I was dismayed by this, but I've come to realize that I guess it's much more reasonable. There's a lot of stuff happening in the real world. Uh, so pushing around biases a little bit is, is more to be expected. There's definitely not proof of causality. Of course, it's just correlational at the end. And I think this uh, results may generalize really only to democratic societies if we're gonna stick with the norm interpretation of the results. To the extent, again, uh, say we had a king and he made some sort of rule, Maybe it wouldn't uh, make us think about this perception of a norm in the first place. Uh, and then, yeah, this, this general framework is just a way to examine the causes and consequences of, of these different sorts of biases. A final, a final thing that I'll mention about why I think some of this, why these results are interesting, is there's been a lot of work out of psychology specifically that's focused on changing biases, and it's very much been focused at the individual level. So you guys might be familiar with Starbucks is probably the most recent, most salient example. And so it's for like, I don't even remember the details. There's some sort of racist incident and they decided to publicize uh, bias training for all of their shops everywhere, which I imagine was like extremely expensive. Uh, we know from work, comparing a number of different interventions, that basically bias interventions, prejudice interventions are not effective. They might last for a day, but there's no evidence that even after a week that anything that you did in like a one hour bias class will persist. Um, and it's basically, yeah, basically there's no evidence of any effectiveness of these sorts of interventions right now. Um, but something where you're changing the, the norm uh, may have a more lasting effect. These Starbucks employees are doing this workshop wherever they are, then they leave the workshop and they're just like back saturated in the society that was kind of giving rise to these biases in the first place. This is much like a broader cultural phenomenon, and so of course, if there was any effect, it would just maybe disappear again. Um, but maybe changing the the entire like society level intervention is a is a far more effective strategy than like trying to rely on individual change. Um, I think important to mention like so here we have a situation where a law was like decreasing uh, biases, but I certainly could go in the other direction as well. There is some evidence for this. So policies such as uh, some things that uh, President Trump in the U.S. has done, like an immigration ban or a rhetoric associated with building a wall. One more recently here in Quebec, to the extent that Bill 21 is associated with attitudes towards uh, Muslim women in particular, we might expect by the same mechanism those attitudes to change, or the biases towards these people to change, if those are perceived as norms. Uh, so finally, just going to thank my colleagues, Gigi Nofosu, who's right here, uh, Jackie Chen, Michelle Chambers, who are in Utah. Uh, and not here, but they're excellent people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very, very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Do you want to field your own uh, questions? Or? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to maybe just call people. Maybe when you do this, we will, when we ask the question, we will introduce ourselves. So, because uh, Eric, I guess, doesn't know us yet. So, 
good to kind of find out who we are, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. we're gonna have a little test for you. So I'm gonna me to remember any of these. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fake I remember you afterwards. Uh, did you have a question? Yes. So uh, Jean-François Dalou, Miguel University. Um, so a very straightforward question. Did you um, think about con regional or uh, geographical contagion effect? Well, so let's say that in, uh, I'm in Vermont, uh, that New York State passed a bill. If half of my life is in Vermont, I should be uh, affected by, by that. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the first question. The second, how can you um, um, reconcile your quasi-experimental language at the beginning mm -hmm. and the fact that you conclude that there's no causal evidence. It seems like it was very ambitious, quasi-random, quasi-experimental, and then you toned down a lot. Why so? Okay, uh, yeah, so question one, is there any sort of like spatial dependency <laughs> of like clusters that are next to each other? Uh, it, or people moving from one state to another? Is that recapping your question? Um, yeah, I don't know if clustering uh, is capturing this. Um, no, no, I agree that it is not. So say we have okay. two states that are next to each other, uh, we're, we're not we're not accounting for in any way how the attitudes in those two states might be influencing one another, whether that's through people moving from one place to another or just being aware of what New Hampshire is going when you when you live in Vermont or something like that. Yeah. Uh, no, so that would just be total noise in the data or something that we're not controlling for whatsoever right now. Uh, the second part of your question uh, was, well, I'm not, I'm not actually totally sure what it was, uh, but like, <laughs> You were asking about the causality and like how our design matches to our to our claims. I do think we have a design that can make a causal claim. Um, I think what you might be talking about is my caveat at the end. So in terms of like the, the continuum of like no causal evidence to like rock solid causal evidence, I put us like around here. This is just not like an experiment where we manipulated anything necessarily. But given how the design works out, I think that we can argue against a lot of things that typically undermine uh, correlational analyses. Okay. But, okay, so a very straight question. Do you <laughs> think that you have a random discontinu discontinu discontinuity? Uh, no. Okay. No, that's, I do not. Okay, that's, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Eric, all right. We've actually, we actually had a coffee last year. I remember, yeah. <laughs> yeah <thank you>. <laughs> 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 it wasn't my thing. <laughs> <laughs> sure it was. <laughs> I, wonder, um, I guess if you could flip back to, I think it was the original graph where you have the state, the uh, bias by states. Sure. Mm -hmm. And this may be, maybe something I just didn't understand. From this. So, the, the, so the gray hash marks. Those represent the, in the state when a form of same sex legalization. Same-sex marriage legalization was passed. Okay, and so I guess my, I mean, my question is, so those are the 35 states you referred to. Right. Okay. Actually, one, I think one of our states, Massachusetts, basically the entire time counts as post because they passed it. They're the first state to pass it and have predates our data. Okay, because, I mean, well, I guess there are two, two questions. One is, I mean, the, the categories aren't 35 states who legalized same-sex marriage and 15 who didn't. There were a set of states who uh, banned it and made it illegal or unconstitutional. Uh, there were so the analysis that I showed you, it was breaking them into those categories. There were states that kind of like flip flopped yeah. back and forth. Maine. In fact, Maine was like that. California was. Yeah. Let me. So actually, we tested this in California. Maine doesn't have enough people. Yeah. Uh, to really yeah, that's do. That's true in every situation. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Maine doesn't have enough people to do the analysis we wanted, but we thought California might. So uh, this is like a less uh, cleaned up and explained figure. But basically, uh, they there's a functional legalization called I get I get mixed up which way this goes. There's Proposition Eight that was passed, then it was overturned, and then it was passed again. So it's essentially saying it was illegal in California, it was temporarily legal in California, then it was illegal again, and then it was legal. Uh, and so even in this even in this limited case study, we thought to examine this, and it, it does match the pattern of effects. So basically. Uh, these are the dashed line here is anti gay bias prior to local legalization, and the darker line is legalization afterwards. Then this becomes before, and this is after. So now it's illegal again, and actually the trend decreased, though it didn't totally turn around in California. And then again, it, it became more steep and more negative going following the final passing. So it more or less maps on 
that I would caution you. This is just California. Okay, so the, the, yeah, the, the, the pattern works in both directions. It does. Okay, and, and then as a, just as a follow up, uh, did you disaggregate legalization by board of referendum versus not at all? No. Decision? So seem... there's a number of different ways of going about this, uh, but we in the end we didn't we didn't even perform any analyses where we like broke that down. So it's certainly possible that maybe like the way in which it evolved the different states is like additionally pushing this around. Um, but we tried, we did like map this all out in a spreadsheet and just thought there was like too much heterogeneity to really kind of like test. Like there's like a group of two over here, a group of five over here, so we never even really pursued it. Uh, but it's certainly possible that like some of those are associated with like maybe stronger grassroots movements. Some of them happen purely through the ju judiciary branch, I believe that I guess theoretically we might not have any grassroots support at all. Uh, but we didn't test that. Yeah. Uh, thanks. My name is Colin at uh, McGill. I was wondering if um, you looked at this with switching out of the gay straight IAT with like an Arab Muslim or black white, and maybe it could be that it's a decline and implicit bias over time, regardless of the group. Mm -hmm. um, and the other question would be more so about the IAT itself and some criticism about whether it's not measuring bias, it's actually measuring norms in and of itself. And right. do you think this would hold if you looked at something like an affective misattribution task? Right, so the effect of misattribution test, we don't really have the data. So one thing, oh, wait, wait. That was the second part of the question. Your first question, part so of the question. Out of the gay straight eye, is it a decline in implicit bias generally and not specific to this? Right, so we do know that across at least the US, almost all biases are decreasing uh, except for anti-fat biases or anti-obese biases, whatever you want to call it. Um, so those are going down as well. We're not, uh, we didn't look at like whether that was associated with same-sex marriage legalization. It would be an interesting control in a way to, to see if like anti-black uh, biases were associated with like same-sex marriage legalization in that maybe it should be. Um, but no, we didn't, we didn't look at that specifically. Uh, the other question is, um, I'm with you on the critique of the IIT. We actually know as a field that it measures a whole bunch of stuff beyond bias, such as your ability to, to task switch, um, your, your like fear of making errors during the task. So like, like most cognitive tasks, it had a lot of other stuff going on. And people try to like separate those like components out. The regional approach is like a little bit different, what we've found. So normally at the end of, like within us, Maybe our implicit biases and our explicit biases are positively correlated around like 0 0.2, 0 0.3. A, uh, novel finding the field is dealing with right now is that when you move to the state level and you're aggregating people together and looking at like the average implicit and average explicit bias of states, they become correlated like 0 0.8, 0 0.9, um, which some might think means that they're like tapping, they're both like measures of bias, but people historically, individually in the field think that these are like some people think that these are like different pools of things that are maybe in my head. Um, so I don't know if there would be different results from the AMP, but my personal stance, I just view implicit measures of bias as like one measure of bias. There's explicit measures of bias that are another measure of bias. And I think they feed into like the same factor, but that is, that is not shared by everybody in the field. Thanks for your questions. Yeah. Um. I am um, I um, I, <laughs> I, I We're I, on I, our date right now. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting one. Yeah. Um, uh, though I, I really like uh, like Colin's question actually about I think it would be actually worth plotting out some other uh, biases to yep. see whether there is a steep movement. But that's uh, just the, uh, one question. Mm -hmm. The other one that I had is about whether you see different types of whether the decline is driven by certain types of states that were at a particularly high or low level of bias, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, be, because they're you know, like a, if a, a state that was at a low level of bias uh, is declining even more, so that there's also like a bottom, uh, you know, it cannot go farther so down, uh, glass ceiling effect and uh, floor, effect. floor effect. Thank you. Uh, so, I mean, how, how do these effects come in and what, who's, or which states are really driving this effect? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so I guess our model is weighting states that have more people and more observations in them. That's what multiple models do. And I would imagine like these these more extreme ones is just kind of like my gut would be like the ones in smaller populations. 
Um, but I think it is a really interesting question. People have asked us before. We haven't actually got around to doing it, um, but it's it's like on the to-do list as well as looking at like the backlash effect. So it's possible that, yeah, there are places where there is no bias and it kind of like stayed no bias and it would be hard for a norm to change the absence of bias in the first place. Even in like a purely, I don't think, even in a purely theoretical space if we want to think about it that way. So I guess norms would be more likely to have an effect when there was like more extreme views in the first place. So I certainly think it's plausible we might find that, but we haven't tested it yet. Mm -hmm. Can you pull that state graph up that you um, have for Ben's question? Yeah, sure. Sorry. I'm Allison from Utah. <laughs> um, it was just a question about the 15 states where you show the increase. <coughs> when you put this graph up, all I see just visually is declines. And so I'm wondering where those states are that are pushing that upward trend post legalization. Yeah, so that data would be like here. So part of this is just like a limitation of the figure. It's yeah. essentially like a density plot based on bias, and uh, the ends of them just go down, just because like these values are higher and there's more values around them that are high. So it's part that's partly a kind of artifact of the visualization. Okay. Um, and I wouldn't make much of that here. I don't. There maybe there's a way to like to do that beyond, but I haven't done it for the purposes of the figure. But the analysis there is like what you should trust more. I guess. Um, well, it would be interesting point. to think about a way to visualize that where you have the 15 states that didn't pass it yeah. at the top of your figure mm -hmm. to, sh to visualize what the trends look like compared to the trends in the states that did pass it. That's true. Yeah, I don't think this figure is very valuable for conveying much more than maybe like the design. Yeah. Um, no, it was just a thinking through because when I read that, I was like, oh, that looks good, like it's going down, but that's not what it is at all. Right, right. That would be, that'd be a really dramatic uh, effect of yeah. the <laughs> So please don't take that away. It's really like, you know, one to five percent of the Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, um, question on the on the data and, and how much pre-processing you're, you're using in the data. So you're geolocating them, but can you also uh, take into account that those people have taken different kinds of tests? They've got if they've taken this test multiple times. Mm -hmm. if, if you have all that information, can you? To some extent, uh, so we don't have anything on if they've like taken the tests, other tests multiple times. We do have if they've tests multiple times. We can control for that. It's usually like a pretty small minority, uh, like like one percent, two percent of the total sample in our experience. So the analyses I'm showing you now are not controlling for that in any way. Um, I think I think the reason is a lot of people do this in like workshops or classrooms or out of their own curiosity. Uh, so, uh, uh, but we do know that people do take like multiple ones. Uh, so I don't know how much, I don't have an idea how that would impact this per se. But people have like looked at that, but it's, it's small enough that um, I don't I don't know the answer. Yeah. And in theory, I'm you should be able to control it very well, right? That's <clears throat> the beauty of an IIT. They they can get a little faster, but it shouldn't really change the direction much. Right. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> like. Taking the IT necessarily doesn't like, have like a huge practice effect. That's like a thing. That, that's a thing that we know. Mm -hmm. I'll show oh, another question. Unless somebody else wants oh, to there's someone behind you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Isadora uh, Borg is also from Weedle. Hey, Isadora. So um, I can't remember if uh, the don't ask, don't tell policy in the military mm. happened. Uh, as a result, or overturning it happened as a result of the Supreme Court's decision or not. But I was also just wondering about the, the data in your data set, whether you know, whether you can um, identify people who are active in the military as a secondary institution that might have, I just see what are the effects of Yeah, or, or no, that's really interesting. So we do, uh, what's not in the data is like once people who are at military bases that complete this. We know this because they're usually at US bases which are yeah. like in the Virgin Islands or something. Uh, so it's an assumption that they're, they're in the military on, on my part. Uh, I have not, usually we just like clean that from the data early on. I have not looked at that. I don't know when Don't Ask Don't Tell happened either, but that certainly seems like the sort of thing that got enough publicity that might be like shaping stuff in here. So currently that's not modeled and it's just noise, I guess. Um, that's a that's a great point. We could look at that and, and maybe should. Um, maybe I guess we could. Yeah, if you wanted to look at like military people specifically, I guess you could look at people from these locations. But there's no demarcation about whether people are in the military or not. Yeah. Just an assumption. Another question. Yeah. Um, 
This is not a definitive design. Eh? No, it is not. This why, slide. Why do you think it's better than definitive? Uh, I don't really know what a definitive is exactly. We're plotting a slope ahead of time and comparing it to the slope afterwards. Uh, we can't do a regression discontinuity design because regression discontinuity means just, like a just comparing what's going on before and after in states which adopt, uh, which legalize, and those don't, mm -hmm. that don't. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that would be the basic of the definitive. Okay, so I think that is captured by our interaction that I, I showed on the later slides. Did you, uh, sure. Uh, I'm not showing you like any, any stats from it, but conceptually at least. I'd like to see the variables, I guess. The what? The variables. I mean, you have sort of a... No, I don't. Okay. Uh, but you can check out the paper. <laughs> <laughs> the, data, the, data, the data is public, if you want to check it. Uh, there's a quote But I don't have anything like the variables uh, in, the, in the thing. But conceptually, I don't know if this is what you're talking about. Well, this is essentially like a three-way interaction where we're now looking at pre and post, but extending whether uh, the, the additional category of beings passed at state level or federal variable or federal level is significant. So this is a pre-post a state level interaction on bias over time. Okay, but I'd be happy to talk to you more about it. Uh, but sometimes I thought like these things are called different things by different fields. I don't actually know what different it is. So I'm Pat from the University of Montreal. Yeah. So your data goes in 2006. Uh, yes. So you have more than that. Because I wonder. We do now. Are, oh yeah. Because I wonder, have you checked the results? Do, do, do you see the trend? Do you see a trend that goes that declines? Or do you see. Because. For this guy right here. Go back to the. Uh, <coughs> so there is really a trend that goes down, and there's no uh, upward movement after 2006. So our data ends in 2016, so if we're talking about that figure before, it's more like an artifact of the visualization because density only goes up when there's like more values there and it just runs out of data. Right. If that's like... That okay, so if you add 2016, 17, 18, 19, yep. you still see a doubt more to movement. So we don't know. So 2019 data will be posted in a few weeks All right. um, by, we know, the project implicit people. Uh, we've been waiting for a little bit of time to pass to try to model the curvilinear effects. We think that it'll yeah, end up going back down, but we don't know that for sure. Because if you go back to the graph that shows mm -hmm. the nice in every country the nice curves, the nice trends, you, you, there's a lot of fluctuation, right? So yeah. perhaps it's just it's just a downward movement that is time specific. But when you take into account a larger period of time, so you take into account 16, 17, 18, 19, actually we will see a upward movement. So perhaps Absolutely. it's just something that is context specific, mm -hmm. because it's just like a fluctuation that you see in the data, you have a lot of fluctuation there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. No, so I don't think that's a really possibility. We have, we have like a, uh, Eugene's dissertation work is going to be looking at that. Uh, it's, it's on the book syllabus. As well as what you said. No pressure. <laughs> uh, um, are there other questions? Because I, I have a general question for you after. Um, is there anything specific on this paper? No? Uh, my general question is if, if you could talk off the cuff of uh, your current projects, just a, a tiny little bit so we know a little bit more about you than this project so as, as a group. Oh, sure. So it's, it's still in the dating, you know, state. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. This is good. This is your self <laughs> Really, really rich. <laughs> Super rich. <laughs> Funnier and more attractive. Uh, no, so th this is going to be, uh, this is this is truly off the cuff and a little bit raw, and it's maybe less related to some of your interests. But uh, one thing, uh, again, that Eugene and I are doing right now is like looking at the overall factor structure of bias in North America. So what I mean by that, we basically have like uh, 10 different types of biases. There's some work uh, by this individual, Altemeyer, and in right-wing authoritarianism that comes from like the 60s, which basically found that it's not like I uh, really am a big fan of say like German people, but I don't like Asian people. Really, they found that like prejudice clusters in individuals that so you're either a person who's high on prejudice and you dislike all other groups, or your person who's low on prejudice was the general takeaway from that body of research. Uh, but that was at the individual level, uh, and so we wanted to examine, at, now that we have like a pretty rich data set, 
uh, millions of biases of maybe implicit and explicit measures of, I think, 14 different types of biases. We wanted to see, is it really just like one big giant factor where regions that are prejudiced against one group might be prejudiced against all groups, or is, or is that a little bit more complex? Um, so it's totally exploratory and descriptive, but essentially we find there's like three factors of bias uh, across North America. We have one which is like a very classic race bias, which is mostly like attitudes towards African Americans, um, which is very traditionally down in the southeast part of the U.S. where um, Uh, where a lot of African-American people live. This is where the plantations were um, originally and where a lot of slaves were imported. Uh, but we all, and then we also have like a religious bias that kind of comes out. This seems to be like anti-Semitic attitudes. Um, and then we have, and then finally we have like a health bias, which is a totally novel finding. We're, these are just names that we're putting on this, by the way. This health bias one seems to be anti-ageist attitudes and attitudes towards people who are overweight. Is that right, yeah. Eugene? Uh, so we have this three-factor structure. What I'm really kind of interested in, in that final one, is that it really breaks down into kind of like conservative versus liberal bastions. So places that we think of, like, so there's there's like high uh, health bias or ableism, whatever you want to call it, kind of on the coasts, places that we traditionally think as being like a little bit less biased. So this work is more showing that there's bias everywhere, it's kind of like towards different types of different types of groups. Um, and that is, yeah, that is still pretty raw. I'm not good at talking about it yet. No. <laughs> uh, but it's something we're working on right now. <coughs> Using similar data. Uh, similar types of data, yeah, absolutely. So if that were due, uh, I think the analysis is a thing called a core-based statistical area, which is like a little bit bigger than a county, bunch, much smaller than a state, which gives us the resolution that we wanted to kind of make some claims. Um, yeah. We're doing some exploratory factor analysis and confirmatory factor analysis for the people care about the model. Yeah. Okay. I have a nice figure, but it's not in here. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I like your graphs. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, I don't want to talk about how much time I put into them. <laughs> so, I yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> it paid off. All right, good. good. Um, any other topic you want? That's it. Uh, That's it. I'm excited to, to holiday party with you. Oh, and see the talks, too, yeah. 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 All right, so um, then we like to Thank you. Nice to see you.